Jen in Jen's Kitchen, Funky New York Apartment Edition. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, you're gonna see this a little delayed after I film it, but it's beautiful here in New York City. It's, the sun's been shining and the daffodils are starting to bloom and um, I'm really starting to feel like spring is in full effect, uh, which seems like we've been living a very long winter. So it's a, it's a really great, it's a great feeling. I'm feeling good. Um, I don't know if many of you knew this, but I did earlier this winter in, in mid January, I contract COVID myself, but um, obviously I'm recovered, fully recovered, but I also have been vaccinated. So I'm feeling really positive about the direction every, with everybody getting vaccinated that we're all gonna be able to get together again. And you know, with a nice weather, it's just, I'm feeling very positive sort of vibe right now. So um, on that note, uh, maybe you would like to invite a few friends over for a little Italian dinner. So that's what we're going to be working on today. Um, it's spring. So uh, when I think spring, I think asparagus. So we're going to be making an asparagus risotto. Um, we're going to put together uh, a focaccia. We're going to start with that. We're going to do a rosemary focaccia. And we're also going to put together a really nice, simple um, composed salad with some greens, some beautiful pink cara cara oranges, and a nice vinaigrette. So um, this is a very simple, straightforward Italian um, Italian themed um, dinner. So um, I think we should get started um, here with our focaccia because that needs to rise and um, of course bake before dinner. Um, if you were doing this at home, obviously you would have started this, you know, well before you would start your risotto. Um, we have the um, the advantage of having movie magic, so we'll be able to, to get this started, cut, come back when things are risen and ready to go in the oven and move on to some other things without taking the hours that we would need to take um, for things to rise. So, um, but let's get started with the focaccia. Um, uh, focaccia is an Italian style bread. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have had it. I make it all the time at Trinity. Um, and I feel like I'm always bringing this up when I'm talking about baking and gluten and shortening and things like that. But one of the things that defines a focaccia is that it has olive oil in it. And the thing that makes focaccia so delicious is that it is tender and it is tender because of the olive oil. And once again, um, the fat in the olive oil is not letting the gluten strands develop completely. So even though we are gonna knead this bread and we are gonna develop some of the gluten, that olive oil is gonna keep this bread nice and tender. So we're, we're, the focaccia has that sort of in-between, in-between uh, like a baguette chewiness and a biscuity lightness. It has that um, a tender crumb, sort of like um, a buttermilk roll that would have butter or buttermilk in it that would be tender, that's also needed, but it's the same sort of texture. So um, what we're gonna start off with um, is our, in this bowl, once again, we'll have the recipes included, but this is four cups of all-purpose flour. Um, you know, you certainly could use bread flour. Um, it's a little, it's stronger, it has more gluten in it. Um, but, you know, I think most people don't have like multiple kinds of flour in their larder they have most people have some all-purpose flour, so I like to kind of keep my recipes based on all-purpose flours, unless I'm making something of really special specialty pastry or something that requires pastry flour. I try to stick with all-purpose flour. So this is uh, four cups of all-purpose flour. Into that, we're gonna be mixing a cup and a half of warm water, but before we, we put the water in, we're gonna be adding, um, a this is basically a packet of active dry yeast. This is, uh, I think this is Fleshman's. Um, uh, it's about two and a quarter teaspoons. So we're gonna put that in the warm water. You need to make sure, I'm not sure the exact temperature, but you need to, it needs to feel warm, but if it's, feel, if it's hot, it will kill your yeast and your, your bread won't rise. Um, I'd have to do a little research to know exactly what that number is, but usually, you know, it's finger warm. Um, um, just a little bit, a little bit warmer than uh, room temperature, but not but not much warmer than that. So we're gonna put our yeast in here, and we're also, when I'm baking, I like to, with yeast, I like to sometimes add a little bit of sugar because it gives the yeast something to chow down on quickly um, and start to, to activate and um, get bubbly. So we're gonna put in um, a teaspoon of sugar with our yeast, and we're just gonna whisk this up. 
Now you can put this aside. Um, there's lots of different theories about this. Some people say you need to let your yeast dissolve um, for 15 minutes till it's bubbly or, but this, you know, with this warm water and the sugar in here, the yeast is gonna start to work very, very quickly. I love the smell of it. I know it's like almost yeast has that almost fruity smell. It's, it's really nice to work with. I can already look in here and see the yeast is like, it's like come to attention. It's sort of moving to the surface and moving around a little bit. Um, so what we're gonna do before we um, add this, we are gonna let it sit for just a few minutes. We're gonna add um, a tablespoon of salt to our dry. Once again, we're mixing our dry ingredients to get together. We put our tablespoon of salt in here. And now we're gonna add some um, fresh rosemary to the dry ingredients before we add the liquid. Um, focaccia, once again, is a versatile thing. One, of, I, I make rosemary focaccia a lot because at my house in um, Portland, I have one of those uh, Oregon epic Oregon <laughs> rosemary bushes. When I tell people on the East Coast that I have a rosemary shrub that's six feet tall and three feet wide, they think I'm crazy. But um, we all know an Oregon rosemary grows very well. Um, so I use, I use rosemary a lot because I have it um, fresh in my yard. This I bought at the store. Um, but the thing about focaccia is that you can also use, um, I make it quite frequently with some fennel seed. That's really nice to use if you don't have any fresh herbs. Um, you can use cracked black pepper. Um, you could you could slice some garlic, fresh garlic, very thinly, and put that in. Um, you know, you could add other herbs. I'm looking at the spice chest I have on the wall over here to think about to be inspired by what I might tell you to add. But really, anything that any flavor that you enjoy. But I think with classically Italian, um, I think rosemary, I think fennel, garlic. Um, maybe some oregano uh, or dried basil, um, things like that. So, um, and, and how much rosemary you, um, you add is really up to you. I mean, I like it pretty rosemary-y, but rosemary is also a very strong herb. So if you include too much of it, it might be a little overwhelming. You don't wanna be chowing down on rosemary. So th that in mind, you don't wanna be chowing down on it. I'm taking out, the, I'm stemming it. I'm just pulling the little, what are they, fronds? I don't know, it's not, I guess it's a leaf. Needle. It's a needle, right, very nice violet. It's like a pine needle more, isn't it? I'm um, just pulling them off the stems. So I've got a little pile going here. I'm gonna go ahead and finish peeling the stem and we're gonna call this enough. And then because it's sort of such a woody sort of uh, substantial herb, I'm gonna chop it up really um, finely um, to go in um, into the dry ingredients. Once again, I have my trusty, um, I think I talked about this in a previous episode, my trusty Kiwi brand um, knife that I like so, so well. Um, yes, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add the dry, we're gonna add this to the dry ingredients. We're gonna make a well in the middle and we're gonna stir the um, wet ingredients, including the olive oil and the yeast into um, our dry ingredients until it comes together and then we're gonna pull it out onto this nice piece of marble and do a little bit of kneading. Um, once again, you could do this all in a, um, in a stand mixer if you had one with a dough hook, but um, we are in Jen's Funky New York Kitchen. Uh, we're doing it old school. I think I've used that term before as well. So um, we've got our rosemary in there. Um, and uh, why don't you come over here and check out this bowl. Our dry ingredients in the bowl. We're gonna stir the salt and the rosemary, um, get it all well combined. And then after we do that, we'll be making a little well um, in the middle of the bowl. This is just sort of to get everything incorporated evenly. Into that, we'll pour our um, yeast and water and sugar. We'll also add our quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. Sort of interesting looking. Um, and we'll start stirring, we'll mix these things together. And one of the things about a well, you do this a lot of times when you're making pasta or something like that, if you want to evenly incorporate it, you sort of start in the middle and start pulling the sides in. It makes it um, like less lumpy from the get-go, more evenly combined. So we're just gonna, the sides keep falling in. We're just gonna keep working this. 
until it turns into a nice a dough that we can um, handle this. And th this is, you know, there are precise, I'm gonna go ahead and incorporate all of it in now. There, there are precise measurements when working, when making breads in terms of um, liquid and flour ratios. But sometimes um, you really have to trust yourself to add or to either not add as much liquid as it calls for or add a little bit more to get a dough that comes together that feels right to you. This is, this is at the stage that I like to call shaggy. Talked about that before as well. Um, this is a nice shaggy dough. And I'm about to get my hand in here and uh, pull it all together. I've gone about as far as I can with the, um, with the wooden spoon. Let's get this off of here. Put our spoon aside. Get my annoying bracelets out of the way. And I'm just gonna start pulling this dough together inside the bowl. I think this is gonna be a nice texture for kneading. Um, some focaccia recipes, um, you can make the night before and let rise in the refrigerator. We're on a tighter um, time frame than that, so um, we're just gonna be letting it rise on the back of the stove. But um, sometimes the flavor is nice if you allow a longer, slower rise in the refrigerator. But we've got almost all of our crumbs. I'm trying to just get those little bits in the bottom there into our dough before we turn it out into the bowl, onto the board. So I've got some flour here. Let me put these things aside real quickly. I've got some flour here to put on the board. I'm gonna put our dough down here. I do like that, like a baby's butt. Okay, so now we're just gonna start the kneading process. And, and for focaccia, like I said, since it's a tender bread, you don't have to go to town forever um, kneading this. I'm gonna say if we give it a good five minutes and you know, uh, we can do a video cut here so you don't have to watch me do this for five minutes. But the thing I will say, the thing you're trying to accomplish when you're kneading dough is the strengthening of the gluten strands, um, which is the flour mixed with the water. And when you're doing this, you're stretching them, you're making them longer, you're pulling them out um, slowly. And you can continue to add, if it starts to get too sticky, you can add a little bit more flour. Um, you don't want to dry your dough out too much. This is getting a little bit tacky. So I'm going to add a little bit more flour to the board. And we're just going to keep kneading this. Use the, you can use the, um, the heel of your hand to get the right pressure. You do need, I will say, it's good to do this if you have a kitchen island or something, something that's sturdy. If you have a table that moves around or is on wheels, it's really difficult to get the, to get the stability that you need to, to, um, to work the dough. So let's take a little breather here and I'll come back when this, when this dough is kneaded and I'll show you what the next, what the next step is. All right, I've been doing some kneading here on the table, which is sort of a, it's always sort of a zen experience for me. I really like it. This dough is beautiful. Um, it's nice and smooth. And so now we're going to, need to let it rise. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bowl. I'm not even going to clean it that we had mixed the dough in. I'm just going to coat it with some olive oil. Pour some olive oil in there. No, I don't know. Tablespoon, tablespoon or two. Kind of roll it around because um, we don't want this dough to stick in here as it rises. I'm going to put it in upside down, spin it around in the oil flip it over so it's nice and coated. And then what we're gonna do is um, put a tea towel on it and we're gonna put it um, on the back of the stove, uh, uh, someplace, you know, on top of the refrigerator, someplace where it's nice and warm. Um, and we're gonna let it rise for 45 minutes. If you don't have, the back of my stove is really a nice toasty place um, to let bread rise. It rises pretty quickly there if, because there's a pilot light. Um, if it's just room temperature and it's kind of cool in your kitchen, it's going to take a little bit longer for this to get um, nearly double in size. It's probably going to take an hour and a half or so. So um, you can really cut down your proofing time if you have it in a warm area. You don't want to have it in um, too warm of an area. You don't want it to start to actually bake, but you want the yeast to really um, have time to feed and uh, build up some gas inside and make it rise. Um, 
I know some people have those really nice um, proofing drawers um, in their fancy ovens. So if you have one of those, please take advantage of that. But anyway, we're gonna put this on the back of the stove and then we're gonna move on to our next um, thing that we're gonna work on and that is our risotto. It's very exciting. All right, um, I thought better of starting the risotto right now. I thought in terms of timing this, um, the best thing to do would be to get the ingredients for the salad together so that when the risotto is actually finished, because risotto is not something that holds very well. You can't like make the risotto to the end and then just keep it warm. It's sort of like you either have to stop before it's done and turn it off or 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 take it the whole way to the end and then you don't have time to work on other things. So, so I decided I'd get all the things for the salad together so then at the very end when we're ready to serve, we can just put the elements of the salad together on the platter and serve it with the risotto. So today the salad we're making is sort of an Italian salad. This is just, I'm just making, this is a sort of, this is the way I cook. I'm just sort of making this up. There's no recipes. There's no um, exact amounts of ingredients. I'm just going to show you the kinds of things that I use when I'm putting together a composed salad like this. So this salad is going to be on a bed of um, spinach and arugula, which I already have washed and dried and ready to go. But we're going to talk about the other elements. Um, it's going to have, these are Cara Cara oranges, and hopefully when we start chopping, slicing these up, they're nice and pink inside. They make a really nice contrast. We're going to put some of those. We're going to have a little bit of sliced radish, and then we're going to have our sliced fennel, which is a lovely um, underutilized Italian vegetable as far as I'm concerned. Um, I know it's sort of um, polarizing because it has this like that licorice taste that some people don't like, fennel seed, anise seed, but some people love it. And I love it because it's so crisp. Um, it's like celery with more flavor. Um, it can be served raw. It's lovely. This is, people don't have it like this very often, but it is lovely braised, um, sauteed in some butter and then slowly braised. It's so delicious that way but it's sort of a traditional Italian way to cook it. But um, today we're gonna to be slicing it, um, putting it on our salad, and we're gonna make a really nice um, vinaigrette to go on it with some orange juice from the oranges that we're using, a splash of sherry vinegar, some olive oil, and a shallot. Um, we're also gonna be using this tool, the mandolin. Um, it's really great for slicing things like fennel, um, very thin, um, and the radish. We'll be cutting the oranges with a knife because they just sort of start to fall apart. Um, if you try to slice them with the uh, mandolin, um, I was saying to Violet, my camera woman, that I wish I had some googly eyes to put on this this fennel ball because it looks like a little face with a little hairdo sticking up. It would be adorable, right? Like Mr. Fennel, um, Mr. Potato Head, but Mr. Fennel um, <clears throat> with the crazy hair. So I think what we're going to do first is we're going to um, I'm going to show you how I break down these oranges. I've got things a little too crowded on my table here. The way I, I break down an orange for a salad like this or for any sort of sliced orange situation, um, you know, you can peel the orange, um, but then you have that white pith on the outside that isn't so attractive. So one way you can make really pretty sliced oranges is this kind of goes back to the way if you watch the video, um, the brunch video, um, how we did the pineapple or the kiwi, where we cut the top and the bottom off. Look at the lovely pink color. I love the Cara Cara um, navels because they have that beautiful color. You cut the top and bottom off and you have this nice flat edge. And then you take your very sharp, the sharpest knife you've got and you sort of just take off these rinds like this. Um, you just slide down. And if you miss some, you can go back afterwards and um, and trim off any pith you might have missed at the bottom. But um, this is a really nice way to make pretty um, orange slices to go on top of a salad or um, even if you're making a fruit plate and you, or breakfast, some sort of breakfast fruit and you wanted to um, put an attractive orange slice on there. So then you've got this, trim off this, you've got this um, lovely orange. Um, this is also good if you want to do really nice sections. You can just, you can see where the lines of pith that separate the sections are. You can just run your knife in there and pull out these beautiful, there's a word for them and I can't think of what it is. The little, the little sections of orange that are separated from the pith. Um, maybe I'll look that up. Um, 
But so here for this, let me move these. I'm going to put these in this bowl. I have a shallot. I'm moving my shallot out of the way. Like I said, I've crowded up my workspace a little bit too much. But, whoops. Um, can you see this? What I'm, yeah. Okay. So um, then you just slice your, um, your orange into these lovely little rounds that you then can lay on top of your salad. Um, I'm gonna do um, uh, one of the oranges like this. I'm gonna do one and a half of the oranges like this, and then I'm gonna juice the other half of the orange for this lovely um, vinaigrette that we're gonna make. We're gonna actually incorporate some of the juice from the orange into the vinaigrette. So um, what I'm gonna do is, this is sort of, I'm gonna cut this one in half and then do it like, um, the other one, but half the orange instead for the slices. And then we're gonna go ahead and put the other half, this orange, um, on the juicer. This orange has a few little dry spots. I think it's salvageable. Um, you know, this is sort of, I know the citrus is sort of a winter, oh, that one's sort of falling apart a little bit. Um, this orange is dry inside. I don't, I don't think that's why it's falling apart, but regardless, we can still use it um, on top of our salad. Um, I know this is it's spring and we're sort of supposed to be moving past, um, it's kind of falling apart at the end. Um, we sh should be moving past citrus, but there's still some nice varieties available. Um, and it's so lovely and fresh with uh, the fennel and greens. So I'm just going ahead and juice this with our juicer. And we're gonna use this as most of the acid. You know, a vinaigrette has um, acid and uh, oil. Those are the key ingredients. Um, and um, you can use for your acid, you can use lemon juice, you can use vinegar. Um, in this case, we're gonna be using some of this orange juice mixed with a little bit of vinegar. And, um, and then we'll whisk in our olives, our olives, pardon me, our shallots. <laughs> So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in this bowl. Move this out of the way. I'm gonna then cut up a shallot. This is shallot is huge. We're just gonna use a small portion of this shallot. Um, and a shallot is nice. I don't know if many of you cook with shallots because it's a little bit milder. It's stronger than an onion, but milder than, um, than garlic. And we wanna chop this up really, really fine. things you should do when you're making a vinaigrette is before you add your oil you want to get your aromatics whatever it is your herbs your spices in with the acid so even if you're just using some white wine vinegar you want to add your salt your garlic um, if you're putting mustard all those things you want to mix in with your acid before you add the oil because the oil doesn't really absorb anything and you want if especially if you want your spice, your flavors to be blended, um, it's good to let them sort of the acid sort of takes the flavors out of the spices. So we've got that in there. We're going to add um, a couple pinches of salt. We're going to add this is just some sherry vinegar, which is nice. It's pretty strong, so we're just going to add a little little splash of that. And so now we've got our salt, our flavor elements in here the orange juice, the vinegar, we're gonna whisk it up a little bit. And then we're gonna drizzle our olive oil in and set this aside. Um, there's lots of different, I'm just gonna sort of pour this in while I'm whisking. There's lots of different um, ratios for vinaigrettes. Some people say one part vinegar to two parts oil or fat. Um, but I think it's really to taste. Some people like a lighter vinaigrette with less oil, a fresher tasting one. So I've got this, oh, you know, I've got a little bit of white pepper. I'm gonna put a dash of white pepper and I'm not using black pepper because I feel like as a visual, I don't want that on the salad. I am having all these like pretty pinks and reds and oranges and greens. I don't want black specks on my salad. So I just put a little bit of um, white pepper in there. 
Now I'm going to taste it because, you know, looks pretty good. Um, I'm going to add a splash more of this. <clears throat> the orange juice is a nice flavor. Maybe a pinch more salt. So now we've got our vinaigrette. This is probably more than we need, but we could put this in a glass jar and keep it in the fridge and use it to dress all kinds of all kinds of things. So that's just a really simple vinaigrette. Um, we're going to now work on this fennel bulb. So for the salad, so um, you know, this sort of an unruly, an unruly looking thing. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take these um, fronds off. We're going to cut cut this off so we're sort of working with something more reasonable. These can be these can be sliced up on the mandolin as well. We can save some of these pretty little fronds as garnish for on top of our salad. It's already been washed. Um, but these are so cute. We might use some of these when we plate our salad, so we'll put some of those aside. Um, this, this would be great if you are making, these parts are great if you're making some stock. If you're making chicken stock and you, you know you could use it in place of, in place of celery. Um, you could even use it in place of the cell, we're putting some celery in our risotto. And oftentimes if I have fennel, I will chop it up fine and use that as one of the aromatics in my risotto. Um, but anyway, we're gonna put these pretty little fronds aside here as garnish. Um, and put that down here for now. And now we're going to um, work on this fennel bulb. You can see that um, it's got a few brown spots on it and you can literally take that whole layer off if you want, but you know, it's a lot of weight and there, it's not an inexpensive vegetable. So sometimes if you want to save, save these layers, you can just sort of um, take your peeler and pull off the, the, um, the, the, the brown bits um, and still use that layer of the fennel. Because these are thick. Once you start taking them off, you, you're losing a su substantial amount of the, of the fennel ball. So I peel off the brown bits. And with the mandolin, this is, um, this is a little bit bigger than the mandolin, so it's gonna be really problematic. So a lot of times I'll just cut the fennel bulb in half. <clears throat> and, <coughs> pardon me. Okay, I had to uh, step away for one second. I think that white pepper that I put in the vinaigrette kind of got in the air and I had a little um, coughing and got it in my sinuses, so forgive me. Um, so let's get back to slicing this fennel. I cut it in half so it would fit on the mandolin. You know, a mandolin is a little bit scary, um, but it is, it's so nice for slicing things thin. If you have to, you just have to really pay attention. You can't look away, you can't, you have to pay attention to how close your fingers are to the blade. Um, but I find it re a really handy kitchen tool. They, they make really expensive stainless steel ones that have, that are on a stand and, um, and have lots of different blades and uh, I, I don't have time for those. Like it's like too much, they're, they don't, they don't, they're not as versatile, they're, I find them difficult to use. This, you buy these at the uh, Asian grocery. Um, they're not very expensive. Um, and there's a, there's a, a, blade, a, a spinning thing here that controls how far up and down this board moves. So how thick or thin you want your things is great for cutting cucumbers and um, things like that. Um, but I'm gonna make this pretty thin. I like my fennel pretty thin. I might do a slice or two, see how it looks and then adjust it. Oh, well, that's pretty nice. Um, you can see how thin that is. So we're just gonna go ahead and um, make our little pile of fennel. Um, one thing about fennel that you need to keep in mind is that it does brown pretty quickly. So one of the things, um, this is sort of turning at an angle on me. One of the things you're gonna need to do if you're not serving it immediately is um, put a little bit of, what we can do is since we have that vinaigrette that has some acid in it, you need to put a little lemon juice, or I think what's happened is I've got it so thin that um, I'm having a hard time. There we go, I made it a little bit thicker so we can get these bigger pieces. Um, you wanna put a little bit of acid on your fennel if you're not serving it right away to keep it from browning. But like I said, if we made this vinaigrette ahead of time, we can just put a tiny bit of the vinaigrette on it um, in this bowl here. Um, and um, it'll keep it from getting brown before we plate it on our salad. So there we've got, look at that lovely pile of fennel. So delicious. 
I'll be eating this later, just so you know. Nothing's going to waste. Um, I'm just gonna, we have this bowl here. We've got some of our oranges that are a little garnished. I'm just gonna put this fennel in here with the oranges for now. Um, oh wait, I do need the mandolin again to cut our little radish garnish. So, but I am gonna put a, just a tiny bit of this vinaigrette on the fennel, sort of move it around a little bit so that it doesn't, it doesn't start to brown on us. We got that. Let me get my mandolin back really quickly. And this radish is, well, first of all, it's spring and radishes are lovely in spring, but it's also, it's, got, it's gonna be a pretty color. See, this is so nice. This, you have to be careful though, because radishes are little. Um, you have to watch your fingers. Um, and you could use a really sharp knife and do this. You're not gonna get probably exactly the same results. You get these lovely, perfect little rounds when you're using the mandolin. So I'm gonna put these. So these are all the components for our, um, for our composed salad. And now I'm gonna clean this area up and we can get to work on the main event, which is our risotto. All right, um, before we get started on this risotto, it's time to um, get our um, focaccia into its baking container and let it have its second rise. But look how much has risen, it's beautiful. It's sort of sitting in a little pool of olive oil, which, what, which is what we want. So um, I love to cook my focaccia in a cast iron skillet. Um, it almost feels like a deep dish pizza or something at that point. Um, so I have this nice big cast iron. I'm just gonna put a little bit of olive oil. The name of the game with um, focaccia is olive oil, olive oil all the time. It makes it nice and crispy on the outside. And I'm just gonna pick up this lovely dough and we're just gonna flatten it out in here. You could also cook this on a cookie sheet. You could make it into a round um, put it on a cookie sheet, but we're just gonna press it out here. So nice looking. Um, and I'm gonna cover it again and let it rise again until it, you know, until it's proofed properly where we can put our finger in it and it sort of pops back, not the whole way back. See right now, it, it's just staying an indentation. We want that, it, for the second rise, we want it to sort of spring back a little bit, hold the shape, but spring back a little. So we're gonna put it in our skillet and if you, like I said, if you're using a cookie sheet, you could you could stretch it out in the cookie sheet into a rectangle or, um, you know, you can make it as thin or thick as you like. Um, it just it will affect the cooking time. If you put it in something small and it's thick, it'll, it'll rise substantially and you'll have to cook it a little longer so it's done in the middle. But um, I love the transfer of heat and how brown and crispy it gets in a cast iron. So that's my, that's my, um, Focaccia, vehicle of choice, I guess you could say. So we're gonna put this aside and let it rise again, and then I'll show you what we do right before we put it in the oven. Okay, let's, now that we've got our um, focaccia up for a second rise, let's talk about risotto. Um, risotto is um, traditionally in Italian cooking would be served as one of the um, primi courses, which is when they would serve um, a pasta, like a pasta dish. So, you know, we have the, in Italian cooking, this, the, 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 the um, phases of the meal um, or the courses of the meal have names. There's the antipasti, which is the first, the first course. A lot of times it is actually what you think of as antipasti, sliced meats, vegetables, spreads, things like that, olives. The next, the next course is the primi, which is, um, you mean the first course, which is usually a starch course. It's usually pasta or risotto, something like that. Then we have the, um, the contorno and the secundi are often served at the same time, but the secundi is usually the vegetable dish and the contorno is usually the main entree, probably the meat. And then we have, of course, the dolce, which is the sweet. Um, but risotto is known normally as a primi. Of course, in American cooking, it's just dinner. Risotto is just dinner if you're not serving a multi-course meal. So, um, uh, risotto is interesting, um, and um, there's lots of interesting things about risotto. It is a rice dish, and um, it is made with rice, but it's made with a very specific kind of rice. Arborio rice is an Italian rice. It's um, named after the town of Arborio, which is in the Piedmont region of Italy. And it's special for risotto making because it is a short grain, it's a short grain rice, 
and it has a lot of starch sort of available on the outside of the rice kernel, which is what you're looking for when you're making risotto. You know, you think of risotto and there's all this stirring, right? Well, what you're doing when you're stirring it is you're breaking down the starch that's on the outside of these um, kernels and you end up with this beautiful creamy sort of um, consistency. If you tried to make risotto with a long grain rice like jasmine rice or basmati or a traditional white long grain rice, you're not going to get that creamy texture that you're looking for when um, you, you would use a short grain rice. Uh, the Italians use arborio rice, some Italians like, um, I think it's called carnaroli rice, which is just another regional um, rice that is, a, that, that is good for risotto because it breaks down in the same way. But in the end, what you want from your risotto is for it to be have this lovely creamy um, consistency, but also have a little bit of bite. Like you, you don't want mushy risotto, you want that, that texture in the rice. And this rice, arborio rice, is especially good to get the, what you're looking for. Um, so the, the method for making risotto is you have um, your aromatics. Today we're going to be using um, an onion, some celery, a little bit of garlic. You can use, like I said earlier, you could replace the uh, celery with some fennel. You could also add carrots, um, uh, things like that, any other kind of like root vegetables that you might want to use um, as your aromatics. You're going to saute those first in a little bit of fat. Today we'll be using a combination of butter and olive oil. Then you actually are add, you add your rice to the fat and the aromatics and you stir it until it just starts to take on a little bit of golden color. You want that toastiness in your rice. And then the process is you start ladling in hot stock. And so you, what you're doing is you're, you're speeding up the breakdown of that starch by adding stock that's already warmed into your pot. And you just keep ladling and stirring and ladling and stirring. And it's interesting, I love making risotto. And it's interesting for me because I don't generally like food that's fussed with, like uh, that has too many steps. Um, like I want to commit Harry Carey if you ask me to make a lasagna. I'm like, oh, I gotta make sauce, I gotta make filling, I gotta layer everything, I gotta cook meat. Like, I don't know why that seems so arduous, but I will stand at the stove for half an hour and stir a risotto. There's something very comforting about the ladling of the hot stock and the stirring and you know, maybe a little drinking of wine, you know, things like that. <laughs> the process is, I really enjoy the process of making risotto. So um, anyway, so we've got some lovely arborio rice here that we'll be using today. But right now we're gonna cut up our aromatics. I have a pan on the stove. You basically a saute pan. This is called a satoir. It's a high-sided saute pan, which is nice. Things aren't spilling out all the time. Um, I have some butter in there. I'm gonna add, I have like two tablespoons of butter. I'm gonna add a splash of olive oil in there to, to um, cook our aromatics. Um, and you want these cut up pretty fine. We're gonna do um, a couple ribs of celery. I'm just gonna slice these long ways. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, these, these, these elements are just adding some flavor and some depth to the risotto. So we're just cutting these up. This doesn't have to be, you know, everything doesn't have to be perfectly chopped in little cubes. It can be sort of rough. Um, put this aside, we'll work on our onion, I think. So that was three ribs of um, celery. We're gonna do about a half of an onion. Put this aside, whoops. Um, you know, there's sufficient ways to cut onions. I usually leave the root on, um, cut off the top. Peel the onion with the root on. Do a little side slice like this. The root is holding this all together. I'm going to make cuts down through the onion. This is a quick and easy way to dice an onion. And then what you get when you go this way is just a bunch of lovely little cubes of onion that and it kind of you can go to the very end by holding on. Whoops holding on to the root. You can kind of flip it over and get the little bits at the end by the root. It's a good way to get a good yield from your onion. So now we've got our um, celery and our onion. I'm gonna go ahead and put this um, into the skillet and turn it on um, medium heat um, until it starts to, you, know, you, want, you want a translucent um, 
onion. You don't want it to really brown very much, but a nice translucent onion. And I like to add, um, my stove doesn't, my burner's not, oh, there we go. Um, I like to add the, I like to get the, the other aromatics going before I add the garlic, because the last thing you want is the browned garlic. It can impart like a bitter flavor. So you want to make sure that you sort of add your garlic afterwards. Um, I take my garlic with the skin on, lay the flat um, blade of the knife against and give it a little smash. That um, helps the skin sort of pop off nice and easily. And then um, I'm just gonna, I don't, you could, you can leave it in slices. I'm gonna kind of cut this up a little bit smaller. Slice it that way, slice it this way. Um, I'm also gonna be adding a little bit, oh, I can hear it starting to sizzle back there. I'm also gonna be adding a little bit of salt um, as we get this process started. I like to add salt. What do they say? Um, you can sort of start to build the levels of flavor. Um, but I'm going to put this aside for now until we get our um, aromatics really going. Um, the other thing I have on the back of the stove here is um, four quarts of chicken stock. Um, if you make your own chicken stock, all the better. Um, uh, I love, I have an Instant Pot and I love every time I roast a chicken down, I just put the carcass and some onions in the Instant Pot and turn it on for an hour. And I and end up with these lovely stocks. Unfortunately, I used all my stocks, so I went and bought some chicken stock today. So this is um, a quart of chicken stock, which is sort of the standard box of chicken stock. Um, and then I usually use, add to that one more cup of water. So we basically have five cups of, of stock and water in here. I'm gonna put this on the back burner in the low heat. We just want it to be nice and warm when we get started actually stirring the risotto. Um, but today we're gonna to be making asparagus risotto. So the lovely thing about asparagus risotto is that, you know, nobody likes like overcooked asparagus, right? So um, the thing about this is that you don't pre-cook the asparagus at all. When you're doing all this ladling and stirring in, at the very end, you, you, when you put this asparagus in, it just steams right in the risotto and it imparts its lovely asparagus flavor. And um, you, it's sort of a one one shot deal. You don't have to blanch it or roast it or cook it ahead of time. So um, I think that makes it really really nice. Let me stir my aromatics back here. A wooden spoon. Like I said, we want to keep. We don't really want these things to brown, so I'm going to turn them down a little bit. Okay. When they cook a little bit longer, we'll add our garlic, asparagus. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's like different styles of asparagus that are in vogue, right? For a while, you can only get big fat asparagus. And then, I don't know, in the 90s, everyone started to have that really skinny, tiny asparagus and everybody wanted that. But um, to me personally, I like sort of a more substantial asparagus sphere because, substantial asparagus sphere, because um, over the chances of overcooking it are, are, sm are smaller. So I like a substantial, these are pretty. These are pretty good size, sort of medium size, and um, you want to get rid of the woody end. Um, you can just cut it off visually. Sometimes the color changes, and you can kind of see where it starts to yellow or or, or get lighter in color. Um, another thing that people do is they sort of they bend it, and it they say it breaks at the. Well, this one's not breaking at all. That's not a good. Oh, there we go. It breaks at the point where you should cut it because that's sort of the natural crisp part of the uh, asparagus. Whoops. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to cut this asparagus after we take off the ends in about, I'm going to say one inch pieces. I like to cut them on the diagonal because they look pretty, but um, that's what we're going for. I'm going to put it back here. I'm going to go ahead and cut the rest of this up off camera and we'll come back and see you in a minute. All right. Um, before we get um, really rolling with the risotto, I think it's time we let this rise again. It's looking really beautiful, the focaccia. You can see it's getting some big air bubbles in it, which is really nice. It'll be nice and airy when we bake it. Um, it's nice when I when I press it, it holds it holds my finger, but it springs back um, pretty nicely. Um, but it still leaves a little bit of an indentation. It's not overproofed. 
this whole time it's been sitting on this um, on this warm oven so it's really helped with the rising time so what's nice about now what we can do with it is um, you know traditionally it has those lovely dimples in it so what we do the way you do that is you just do this <laughs> this is sort of very satisfying I mean, you poke your fingers in here um, if it was overproofed, these these little uh, holes would not stay. So we know that see, we have a lovely dimple surface. And the reason we're gonna dimple it is because we're really gonna go for it here. We're gonna pour a little bit more olive oil on top and these little dimples will hold the olive oil and make it nice and crispy on top. We're gonna add that. Um, we have some more of this. We used this last week when we're making our dirt, this Malden sea salt, which is this large crystal um, sea salt. You could use kosher salt if you wanted or some other sort of large um, finishing salt. We're just gonna sprinkle this um, on top. Um, and uh, for aesthetics and maybe a little bit of flavor, we're gonna throw this lovely sprig of olive, um, pardon me, rosemary on top. And we're gonna put, look at, look at that, it's beautiful. Um, it's got the oil, the salt, the rosemary, um, and it's gonna, it's gonna rise, it's gonna get nice and golden brown on top. Um, so I'm gonna put it right now into a 400 degree oven. I'm gonna say for probably a half an hour, but we'll keep tabs on the time so we know um, how long it's been in there. But like I said, the time, baking time will be different um, depending on how thick you've made it. If you stretch it out really thin, on a sheet pan or you've put it in something with a little bit more depth, it's gonna take a little bit longer to cook, but we'll keep um, our eye on the baking time for this. All right, let's put this in the oven. Here we are at the stove and we've got our aromatics. The onions are looking nice and translucent. I, I just recently added the garlic so it wouldn't um, get too overcooked and bitter. Um, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add our arborio rice. Um, the ratio we're working with today is a cup and a half of rice and uh, four cups of stock. But like I said, I always add an extra cup of stock just to loosen it up at the end. And when you plate it, it's nice to have a little bit of stock to put in the bowl. So I usually add a cup of water to my quart of stock. So um, we've got this here. We're gonna put this um, cup and a half, the cup, we're gonna eyeball the half. Um, put the rice um, in, the, in the skillet. Coat it with the... Um, fat that's in here, which is um, butter, a little bit of butter, a couple tablespoons of butter and a splash of olive oil. Um, I'm famous for not measuring my rice and then putting so much in that I have to keep putting stock and then I end up with like enormous quantities of risotto. But you know, that that's sort of the Italian grandmother in me is that I have to, um, uh, as my mother says, too much is never enough. So that's generally um, the ethos I use when I'm cooking, which sometimes gets me in trouble. But um, so here we are. So we're going to let this rice sort of, you know, it's absorbed some of this oil and it's going to start to brown up a little bit. You can see on these rice grains, they have, um, I don't know if we're going to see these in the light. Um, can you move to the side, Violet? So there's a little bit more. There we go. You can see that they're interesting because they have a white sort of um, middle and a clear clear outer side that's the the outer part is that's the part that's going to be breaking down when we're stirring to make to make this creamy um consistency uh long grain rice doesn't have that sort of clear out outside coating of starch so that's why it's not so good to use in this application so as soon as this starts to get a little bit of color on it which should be soon i'll turn the heat up a little bit then we add magic ingredient. We're gonna add some dry white wine. Um, we're cooking uh, Italian food, so we're gonna use a Pinot Grigio. You could use any sort of dry white wine. Um, this is very inexpensive wine. Um, I know some people say that you should use expensive wine in your cooking because it reflects um, you know, the care you put in, but I don't generally feel <laughs> that way. If I'm cooking with wine, I'm gonna buy something inexpensive. Not undrinkable. I will, of course, drink this wine um, after I use it for cooking and um, I chill it, but um, I don't think you need to go and buy some really expensive wine for an application like this because it's going to be mixed with aromatics and chicken stock and cheese and all manner of things. So the, the little tiny nuances in the flavor are not, not that important. Um, like I said before, I'm going to add a little bit of salt. We're kind of layering the flavors here. Um, you can see it's starting to get a little bit of color on it. I'm gonna let it rest. 
Back here we've got our, you can see the steam rolling off of our, our pot of stock. It's ready to start um, ladling, be ladled in. Um, I will say a very important piece of equipment for risotto, maybe besides the pan to cook it in, really important is the ladle because you're constantly moving stock into this pot. Um, and if you don't have a ladle, you're gonna, it's gonna be trouble. Um, um, but first we're gonna put the wine in. Oh, we're, oh, see, we're getting certain. Oh, look, look at that. Can you see that little bit of brown? We're getting toastiness we're getting. That's exactly what we want. We don't want too much of it, but we're getting a nice, nice amount. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna add our wine. We're gonna add about, I'm gonna eyeball it, but about a half a cup of wine. Nice and hot. I'm gonna turn this heat down a little bit. We're gonna stir that until um, it's absorbed. Sort of, um, you know, a lot of the alcohol is gonna dis dissipate, so we're not really worried about that. But you can see already that that is um, pretty much gone. Let it cook for a little bit longer, start to dry out a little bit, and then we'll start with the stock ladling. Um, I did want to say before we start ladling the stock that I did get all of our asparagus prepped up. Um, you want to have that ready and good, ready to go because it, it's sort of a, when, it's, when it's time to add it, you want it to be all done. I have a little parsley here for garnish, um, but we'll talk about that later when we plate. Um, so now we've got our, you can hear that the wine is absorbed, and so now we're just going to ladle by ladle, just going to start pouring this stock in. You want to have this, put about a ladle and a half, you want to have this on um, pretty low heat um, because you want to have time enough to stir it before the, um, the liquid um, sort of evaporates. So, and this is what we're going to be doing for probably, I don't know, 15 minutes, um, 20 minutes. And, and, you know, people say, I don't like to make risotto because I have to stay at the stove. You don't, you don't have to stay at the stove. If you have the heat at a nice low temperature, um, this may be even, I wouldn't walk away from it when it's cooking quite this, bubbling quite this hard. But, you know, you could turn it down to low, low simmer, add some liquid, and if you had to go take care of something else or some other part of the dinner, you can come back and, uh, but you do have to periodically um, work with it so that you get that um, consistency at the end. But um, you don't have to stand in one place. You can move around. <laughs> but you can see already, it's already, the starch, you can see on the sides of the pan, the starch is starting to come out of this beautiful arborio rice. Um, and we're already starting to get that texture that we want. Um, but so that liquid is almost gone. We're going to put in another half a ladle and um, we're just going to keep stirring. Um, the way I tell if my risotto is done is I taste it and when it's at the consistency I want, when it still has its al dente in the middle, it's to the tooth in the middle, um, but has a nice creamy consistency on the outside, that's how, that's how you know. So. Um, I'm not going to make you watch me stir this for 20 minutes, so we'll take a little break, but and I'll keep going, and then maybe we'll come back when I think it's time to add that asparagus and some of the other items. All right, let's take a little pause in our risotto. It's uh, bubbling away here. I've been stirring and stirring. It's looking nice, but let's check on our focaccia. It's been in the oven about 400 degrees for about half an hour. Let's take a look at it. Ooh, look at that, folks. That is beautiful golden brown, um, looks nice and crisp. You do the tap test when it sounds hollow. I don't know if you can hear that uh, on video, but um, it looks perfect. At this point, um, if you're really crazy, you can pour a little more olive oil on, on it that kind of soaks in, but um, we'll let this cool. We'll pop it out of this skillet. Um, and um, when uh, we plate up the rest of dinner, we can see what it looks like on the inside. We'll have a nice slice. But until then, I'm gonna go back to stirring this risotto. Okay, so um, we've been stirring this for, um, I don't know, 15 minutes now, something like that, 10, 15 minutes. Um, I tasted it, it's getting, you can see how the grains have sort of puffed up and we've got some nice starch building up in there. Um, um, I, test, I tasted it, it's not quite finished, but this is the perfect time to add our asparagus. I'm gonna add two nice 
ladlefuls of stock that the asparagus can steam in. Stir them in, I'm gonna add the asparagus. Just gonna put it all right in here. And then we're gonna gently stir it. We don't wanna break up our asparagus, um, the beautiful little, is that called a crown? Is that called an asparagus crown? What's that called? A toppy? I don't know. <laughs> a point, asparagus points. So we're gonna sort of gently fold in the asparagus and we're gonna let it um, sort of steam, steam cook in here um, with the risotto. We've, we've broken down a lot of that starch, so we don't really have to be so concerned about um, um, stirring the rice at this point. Now we're just kind of letting it cook. I'm gonna put another ladle of stock. One thing, one thing I will say is that um, if you're, if you're going along with this process and you, you notice that your stock is getting low, I've already done this once, I added a little bit more water um, to my stock um, because you don't want to end up, that way you sort of have some stock still left in your water. You don't want to end up with just plain water at the end. So I sometimes will um, add stock, add, add a little bit if it looks like um, I'm gonna need a little bit more liquid to make it all come together. All right, so our asparagus has been in here, sort of steam. You can see it's got this beautiful color and some of the starch from the rice is starting to coat it. It looks really nice. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit more stock. I'm going to um, season it with a little bit more salt and pepper. I haven't put any pepper in yet. This will be our first pepper hit. And then, you know, we talk a lot about the breaking down of the starch and risotto to make it creamy. But um, some of that is, some of that's a misnomer because the thing that really makes, um, that really finishes the risotto beautifully is, um, you guessed it, a bunch of butter. So um, risotto is traditionally um, finished with butter. We're putting in four tablespoons of butter. And of course, we're gonna put in about, I'm gonna say about a half a cup of, um, maybe a little more, three quarters of a cup of Parmesan cheese. We're gonna stir this in. I'm gonna to start to turn the heat down here. But look at that, ooh wee. It's looking really, really nice. Um, at this point, you can taste it for seasoning, for salt, for pepper, things like that. But this is just looking so beautiful. And uh, we, you make sure your butter's melted and your cheese is combined. I'm gonna let it sit here for just a minute and we're gonna put together our beautiful salad and then we'll plate this up and I'll show you the traditional way that um, risotto is plated. But um, I've tasted this a few times now. We have a nice soft exterior on the rice. It's a little bit al dente in the middle. It's looking perfect. Um, we don't wanna wait too long to plate this because our asparagus is gonna continue to cook. So um, we don't we want that to, it's still quite crisp, crisp pardon me. But um, um, we're gonna come back to this in just a second. We're just gonna plate up our salad. Okay, I think we're coming together. This whole thing's coming together. Um, our risotto is just finished. I've gotten out the greens for the salad. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, we're just gonna lay out the, 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 tops, the topping for the salad. You call it composed salad because you're sort of composing ingredients. Um, we're gonna lay out our beautiful Cara Cara oranges. Um, on top of our bed of greens. We're going to sort of pile up our beautiful, another nice round here, pile up our beautiful um, sliced fennel that's already been dressed a little bit with the dressing to keep it, see it's kept its color very nicely. We're gonna put some of these lovely little radishes um, on top for that nice bite and a little bit of visual interest. And um, I, I enjoy a composed salad much more than a tossed salad just because I'm a visual person. And I like seeing all the elements um, sort of laid out and then we've got these lovely fennel fronds that we saved that we can sort of put on here as a garnish. Put them around, looking really pretty. I have a little bit of parsley 
that I chopped to garnish the, um, we just add a tiny bit of that for some color. We've got our vinaigrette that we whipped up earlier. Like I said, we don't need to add much of this because we've already got some on our um, fennel, but we're just gonna put a little bit so that the greens, the greens have a little bit and it'll have some nice like chunks of um, shallot in there. And what I would like to do is um, finish it. Um, we could use some of that mold and salt. I put that away already, so I'm gonna use this because it's here. Just a little bit of finish it with just a tiny bit of salt. Um, so we've got that. I'm gonna put these vegetables aside. It's time to plate up some risotto. And there's sort of a traditional way to plate risotto um, that I think people don't really know. Um, and that is, we've got it, it's so lovely. It's um, nice and creamy looking. Asparagus is a lovely color. I have these beautiful Deruda plates. I love a good plate. <laughs> it's like a pasta bowl, basically. And so traditionally, risotto is served in a bowl like this, a rimmed bowl, where you put a nice serving in the middle. And then you take um, your stock that you have, you'd like to have a little bit of stock remaining, and you take just a little bit of your hot stock and you um, ladle it onto the bowl into the bowl so it sort of the risotto is sort of sitting in like a little um lake of of uh, stock then we're gonna finish it of course with um a bunch of parmesan maybe um a little bit of black pepper i think it's well salted because of uh, the Parmesan cheese adds a salty element. So we've got our risotto. Now all we've got left is our focaccia. Let's see if we can get this beast out of the skillet. Look at that, so beautiful. Um, I'm gonna get my knife and we'll make a slice of that on the cutting board here and then we'll have our little Italian feast Here's a nice serrated bread knife. Got this. It's lovely inside. Cut it in wedges. As you can see, it is still <laughs> steaming hot from the oven. So here we go. I don't know if, I, if you want to come over here and get a um, shot of all of our lovely things. You can see what this risotto really looks like um, from the top, from the top, and our composed salad. Got a few crumbs here. But here we go. This is what we've accomplished today. Oh, I forgot to put a little bit of um, this chopped fresh parsley on top here. So we have our beautiful spinach and arugula composed salad with some fennel, some lovely care care oranges, some radishes, and that nice vinaigrette we made with some shallots, the juice from the oranges and some sherry um, vinegar. We've got our uh, beautiful spring asparagus risotto um, finished with some Parmesan cheese and then of course our lovely um, focaccia. So I think this was this is a nice combination of things. Um, the one thing we're missing, of course, is the dolce. We don't have the sweet. Um, I thought it was a little too much to include, but you know, this would of course be nice with some biscotti and um, after dinner um, coffee and biscotti. Or uh, you know, if you're feeling really um, adventurous, you could whip up a tiramisu. That's a that's a job for a whole other episode. We could do an entire tiramisu episode at some point. But um, I hope this looks uh, appetizing to you guys. It sure was fun to make. It's some of my favorite. I love making focaccia. I love making risotto. Like all of these things are my, some of my favorite things to put together. It makes me feel, they're sort of like a, I don't know, an earthy sort of rustic. It's a rustic cooking, which is really my favorite, my favorite sort of cooking. So um, I hope you guys will, will give some of these items a try and uh, in your own home kitchens. And it sure has been fun. Um, doing this and um, being with my daughter.
for these couple of hours. And uh, I hope you guys are all doing really well and feeling healthy and really out enjoying the spring.